All right, Matt. So last year, uh, last school year, Michael's math teacher, she kept this plant on her desk. She had one plant that she kept there the whole year. And Mm -hmm. it seemed pretty healthy throughout the whole year. But the weirdest thing about it was that it ended up growing square roots. (laughs) (laughs) Huh? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. All right, everybody, here we are again. Matt, how you doing tonight, brother? I'm doing pretty good. Good. How about you? I'm doing all right. It's hot now in Texas, so yep. we've hit summer. But, I mean, we need it to dry out all this rain. Um, we, we are getting flooded like crazy here. It's so bad that I got pulled over yesterday on the interstate by a game warden, and I was ticketed for not wearing a life jacket. <laughs> that's how bad it is it's like a johnny carson joke how <laughs> wet is it yeah that's so bad i got pulled yep but uh we want to tell everybody go check out the Podbelly network go to podbelly.com and you can find different shows to listen to and different tricks and tips on starting your own podcast we also want to thank tonight's sponsor magic spoon Uh, We'll talk a little bit more about them here in a minute. Now, we usually save this to the end of the show, but I wanted to touch on it here at the beginning. If you have not given us a five-star rating and a review on iTunes, please go do that. Um, Click the five stars, type something, doesn't matter what you say. All it's doing, it's helping bring us up in the charts and allowing more people to find the graveyard. You can click five stars and then type, I hate your face. That's fine. (laughs) You can put anything you want. I I would prefer you didn't because I'm sensitive, but uh, whatever you want to type, do that. Just it, It helps bring us up in the charts and it helps get more people into the graveyard. Also, while you're on the interwebs, they're giving us a review. You can go over to patreon.com slash graveyard tales and sign up to become a patron and get a whole bunch of bonus content from us, videos, extra episodes, occasional ramblings from us, stuff like that. So go over there, patreon.com slash graveyard tales. Now, Matt, this might be a long episode, so let's go ahead and get into it. Tell us. What are we talking about tonight, brother? Okay, so tonight, Adam and I are going to dig into one of the most influential, I I guess that's a good way to put it, um, American cults in the modern era. And a lot of you will probably remember this. We're going to talk about Heaven's Gate. Yes, sir. Yeah, so... You know, that was, I remember when this happened, it was bizarre. Yes, it was. Okay. I mean, like, I I, I can remember other stuff coming out about different cults. I can remember the big standoff in Waco, all of those things. This one was truly bizarre. And and after, after everything and all the dust had settled, we learned so much about what had gone on and what oh, yeah. had led to these. But a lot of people, you you may not know exactly what Heaven's Gate was all about, about the people that, that were involved with it, the people that were the leaders of it. So we're going to kind of dig into it tonight um, because it does have some graveyard tale-ish overtones. Right. Okay. Um, so just like with anything else, uh, any of our other shows, go and check out our sources. They are in the notes of the show. 
uh, and you can follow up if any of these things interest you. You can see where we got our information. Okay, so we're going to flip flip the script a little bit tonight. I'm going to lead in, and Adam's going to wrap us up tonight. What? Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> Ad- Adam's always the history guy, but um, but a nice little refreshing change. So when we talk about Heaven's Gate, the you have to start with their their leader with with this iconic figure that became the face of of Heaven's Gate, and and that was uh, Marshall Applewhite. Now, if you've ever seen a picture of this dude, <laughs> oh buddy, like wow, this dude he looks crazy in the picture. Yeah. You 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 almost can see cult in his eyes. Yeah, I mean it, it, it's it's really strange when you when you see him. He, he's just all wide eyed and everything. And there's plenty of ways to see him. There's still videos out there where you can go and and hear him talk. Mm-hmm. But Marshall Herf, Herf. That's a new one. Middle name. I, I've it's never heard that name. Yeah, Marshall Herf Applewhite Jr was born in Spur, Texas on May 17, 1931 to Marshall Herf Applewhite Sr. and his wife, Louise. Now, Applewhite's father was a Presbyterian minister, so his upbringing was religious in nature. Now, his childhood was not so involved, but as a young adult, Applewhite would go on and study theology at Union Presbyterian Seminary But he would eventually leave the school to pursue a career in music, becoming the music director of a Presbyterian church in North Carolina. Now, around this time, Applewhite married Ann Pierce, and they would later have two children. In 1954, Applewhite was drafted by the U.S. Army and served in Austria and New Mexico as a member of the Army Signal Corps. He left the military in 1956 and enrolled at the University of Colorado, where he earned a master's degree in music and focused on musical theater. So far, he doesn't sound like a cult leader. No, sounds like a normal dude. (laughs) Sounds like a pretty normal guy. Now, for the next 10 to 15 years or so, Applewhite bounced around. He had a failed attempt at a singing career in New York. He took a position at the University of Alabama, but would be dismissed due to his pursuit of a sexual relationship with one of his male students. He separated from his wife in 1965 after she learned about the affair. And then later that year, Applewhite moved to Houston to serve as the chair of the music department at the University of St. Thomas. Now, he would resign that position in 1970 and moved to New Mexico, where he opened a deli. But then he moved, ended up moving back to Texas in 1971. So, you know, he, he he moved around a lot. You know, he's been to New York, he's been to Alabama, and now he come back to Texas, and he's in New Mexico. Now he's back in Texas. Seen a lot so of the world. He's seen, yeah, he's seen a lot of the world, and he's he's been around, and he's had some different experiences. But in 1972, Applewhite met someone that would forever change his his outlook. And, and that was Bonnie Nettles. Now, Bonnie Nettles was a nurse who had an interest in uh, theology and biblical prophecy. Now, Applewhite and Nettles quickly became close friends. And he later recalled that he felt like he had known her for a long time and concluded that they must have met in a past life. Nettles told Applewhite their meeting had been foretold to her by extraterrestrials, persuading him that he had a divine assignment. Hmm. All right. (laughs) Now, by that time, he had begun to investigate alternatives to traditional Christian doctrine, including astrology. He also had several visions, including one where he was told that he was chosen for a role like that of Jesus. 
Okay. All so righty. Now, so so now we've we've got we've got our, our buddy Marshall Applewhite um, beginning to believe that he is a Jesus type figure here on Earth. And he was informed of that by aliens. By aliens, yes, through visions. But all makes sense. But he had somebody that was really promoting that in Bonnie Nettles. She had a very similar belief as far as, um, you know, aliens, you know, their involvement here on Earth and inter intermingling that with theology. So that combination really, really fueled Applewhite's fire. Now, Applewhite and Nettles would form a relationship, but not a sexual one. They lived together in a loving but platonic cohabitation. Now, this is where it gets a little funny. They renamed themselves Bo and Peep, and they set out on a six-month road trip across the U.S. Now, while traveling, Applewhite and Nettles pondered the life of St. Francis of Assisi and read works by authors including Helena Blavatsky, R.D. Lang, and Richard Bach. Now, they kept a King James version of the Bible with them and studied several passages from the New Testament, focusing on teachings about uh, Christianity, uh, asceticism, which is an absence from sensual pleasures. So essentially, not just an abstinence from sex, but an abstinence from from any kind of 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 physical pleasure like this. That's a bummer. Yeah, <laughs> and eschatology, which is not scatology. Is it study of Eskimos? <laughs> Close. Oh, okay. Eschatology is the study of last things. So we see eschatology you you really will um find a lot of talk about the book of revelation right um right. end times armageddon those those kind of things like the the people that were really big into the mind calendar uh the end yeah. of the mind calendar and stuff like that yeah so that that's a good example of of eschatology by June of 1974, Applewhite and Nettles' beliefs had solidified into a basic outline. So they they had they they had a solid basis of of what their belief was. They concluded that they had been chosen to fulfill biblical prophecies, and that they had been given higher level minds than other people. They wrote a pamphlet that described Jesus's reincarnation as a Texan. I totally get that. that <laughs> I, I understand completely. That reminds me of something you're going to like. Uh, this uh, reporter was going around to different churches throughout the country. And in every church he went to, he would notice there was a golden phone sitting by the pulpit. And he would ask the the preacher or the priest or whatever, what what is this phone? And and they would say, well, this is a direct line to God. And he said, okay, well, how does it work? And he said, well, it, it's it's nine ninety nine a minute, but you know, you get a direct line to God to ask anything. He said, okay, all right, that's interesting, and. And as he went touring through all the other churches around the U.S., he noticed every one of them had one of these golden phones. And, you know, they all ranged about $10 a minute, something like that, if you wanted a direct line to God. Well, he got into uh, got into Texas, and he was talking to the preacher about it. And the preacher said, yeah, yeah, we got the direct line to, direct line to God right here. And, um, he goes, okay, so at nine ninety nine a minute. He goes, no, he goes ninety nine cents a minute. And the reporter was like, ninety nine cents a minute. Well, why is it why is it so cheap? It's been ten bucks everywhere else. He goes, it's a local call. You're in God's country. <laughs> <laughs> I love that joke. Oh, that's great. Only Texans will laugh at that. Everybody Only else, Texans will laugh. <laughs> 
Everybody else our, will go. Our, our, our people that have friends in Texas. Yeah. So. Yep. But the the idea that Jesus is, was reincarnated as a Texan is a thinly veiled reference to Applewhite himself. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, furthermore, they concluded that they were the two witnesses described in the book of Revelation and occasionally visited churches or other spiritual groups to speak on their identities, often referring to themselves as the two or the UFO two. Now, they believed that they would be killed and then restored to life and, in view of others, transported into a spaceship. Now, this event, which they referred to as the demonstration, was to prove their claims. Now, everybody thought they were nuts. Well, sure, yeah. <laughs> nope, nobody really was giving them any kind of credence. They were just kind of like, where the hell did these two come from? Right. Okay. And, you know, that was upsetting, but it, it didn't slow them down any. So in August of 1974, Applewhite was arrested in Har Harlingen. Is it Har Harlingen? You ever heard of that place? No, I haven't. Probably Harlingen. Har Harlingen, Texas. Okay, we'll go with that. If you're from there, I apologize. You can you can message me and tell me how wrong yeah. I pronounced it. Me too. I apologize. I, I've not heard of that. <laughs> But he was arrested for failing to return a car that he had rented in Missouri. He was extradited to St. Louis and jailed for six months. Now, at the time, Applewhite maintained that he had been divinely authorized to keep the car. That's it. So, so some, some, some heavenly voice told him, uh, you just need to keep this car. It's like <laughs> don't, the Don't worry about paying for it. Yeah, right. Just go ahead and keep it. It's like that turn in the middle of the interstate authorized vehicles only. He's like, yeah. no, I, I was divinely authorized to turn around in this spot. <laughs> but while in jail, he studied on theology and subsequently abandoned the discussion of occult topics in favor of extraterrestrials and evolution. Extraterrestrials and evolution. Those two... Two E words I never thought I would read in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but after he got out of jail, uh, Nettles and he resolved to contact extraterrestrials and begin seeking like-minded followers. I don't know how they thought they were going to find like-minded followers. They, they, they were the two that believed this. They, they were more or less going to have to convince people that they were right. Right. I, I mean, if you look at their past uh, track record with it, nobody believed them. Right. Now, they published advertisement for, advertisements for meetings where they recruited disciples who they called the crew. At these events, they were reported to represent beings from another planet, the next level, as they called them, who sought participants for an experiment. They claim that those who agreed to take part in the experiment would be brought to a higher evolutionary level. Sounds like a bad pitch for a medical experiment in college. <laughs> yeah, you want to you want to get superpowers? Come and join yep. our medical experiment where we inject you with liquid mercury. Right. You want to ascend to a higher plane of existence? <laughs> Come let us shove these electrodes in the back of your head. Yeah, that's right. We're just going to see what happens. Right, right. <laughs> Observational. The Applewhite and Nettles were uh, huge fans of Star Wars and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. And that led them to bring some sci-fi to the group, resulting in theories like Mary had been taken aboard a spaceship and impregnated with Jesus. Just going to let that sink in. Right. <laughs> It also led to the members wearing patches that said, quote, Heaven's Gate Away Team, which is a reference to the specialized crew that went on missions to alien planets in Star Trek. Sure. Yep. The now, red coats that always got killed. 
Yeah. <laughs> Those guys, you know, if 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 you weren't, you know, um, Spock or or Bones or Kirk, and and you beamed to some planet, you were the one that wasn't coming back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like the cast shows up, and they're like, "Crap, I got a red coat today. I'm dying. This be my last episode." But it turns out that Applewhite often discussed extraterrestrials using phrases from Star Trek, and he stated that aliens communicated with him through the show. That's a new Again, one. That's a new I, one. I, I want to stress, through the show. Yeah. It, it's a show. <laughs> they, they were using the writers of the show to talk to him. Uh, yeah, that's what he thought. So, Applewhite also believed in the ancient astronaut hypothesis, which claimed that extraterrestrials had visited humanity in the past and placed humans on Earth and would return to collect a select few. History.com has a whole thing on that. Yeah, but this is, this is a little different than aliens came to Earth and showed Egyptians how to build the pyramids or taught the Mayans how to you know, use the sun as a calendar and all that. That's true. It's different than Sukalos's version. Yeah. It, this is more or less saying that aliens put humans here. Yeah. You know, that the population of earth was brought about by alien. I, to be honest with you, I have heard that from several of the people. So this part of his speech, um, I'm not going to poo poo as, that wackadoo because well, I've heard a lot of people talk about that where it was like they created us and left us here or they created us out of the lower great apes that were already here and formed us into you know homo sapien and yeah. so I know he's pro he was not the first to come up with that, but no, I'm wondering yeah. if he like, did he get that from somebody else or did he just come up with that himself? Now, this this was already a hypothesis and it wasn't his. He just, you know. He, he bought into it. It wasn't like co-evolution of the thought. He heard it from somewhere. Right. And right. Yeah. He, he had studied on it now. Parts of his teaching bear similarities to the Reformed Christian concept of election, uh, likely owing to Applewhite's Presbyterian upbringing. So he's mixing in his religious background. And if you if you don't know what that that may be a foreign term, that that election. But that's that whole idea that, you know, when when Earth was created, there was a select number of few people that were predestined for you know, salvation. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. All, all of the other, you know, schmucks wandering around, they were just kind of, we were, we were window dressing essentially. Yeah. And yeah. we were just kind of, you know, just milling around and we'd die off. But there was this select group that they, they were going to get after their time on earth, they were, they were going to get the prize and right. get to go back. Now the cult's philosophy, as I said, took its roots from Apple White's Presbyterian upbringing and essentially grafted belief in extraterrestrials into Christian theology. Apple White told his disciples that he was the second coming of Jesus Christ, that God was an alien and that they were living in the end times. Isn't it funny how so many of these cult leaders go to that that they yeah. are the second coming. I mean, you, you, Apple White, Koresh, uh, uh, Jim Jones. Yeah. They all said they were either the second coming or that they were the messenger of yeah. God. It's yeah. just, I, wow. I, 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 I don't, I, I haven't figured out why that is the go to. Or I guess because it has a powerful connotation to it, I guess that they can they can trick people easier using that. I don't yeah. know. 
Now, when you when you look at Applewhite and Jim Jones, you're looking at two people that had a religious background that right, had sure. study. I mean, Jim Jones was a pastor. Yep. Um, you know, long before the the People's Temple. Um, you know, Applewhite was raised in in a pre, by a Presbyterian minister. You know, had studied theology, had gone to divinity school. So that was so, their their most powerful entity right, then. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know enough about David Koresh um, to know what his background was. Um, but I, I would dare say that at some point along his early life, he had a heavy religious yeah. influence. Yeah. His was all about the kind of like um, Applewhite here, the end in times and the seven right. seals and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, if, 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 you, if it's not coming to an end, you know, how are you going to convince people that they need to follow you? Right. Sure. Got to have the drama I mean, and the, the, the problems that you can fix for them. I remember there was a song, um, from, uh, it was on the radio from the Bob and Tom show. Yeah. It was said, uh, I'm looking for some stupid people with some money who would like to follow me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's how it goes. But but they, the Heaven's Gate members would read the Bible, especially Revelation chapter 11 in the New Testament, which is a section about two witnesses that would prophesy. Now, we, we they've already... They've already determined Nettles and Applewhite that they were these two witnesses. Now, at the end of their prophecy, they would have to battle demons, which Applewhite and Nettles called the Luciferians. Now, they referred to their human bodies as containers and that they could be abandoned for a higher physical existence. Okay, so th this whole idea was that. Like a mech suit. Yeah, your actual your actual being is just stuck inside this human body. That there's mm -hmm. something far better for you if you know how to access it. Sure, yeah. And you can you can leave this this body, this this container and you know, escape to a much higher higher level of existence. And I mean, a lot of religions have something similar, but the way they talked about it to me, it just makes me feel like it's, you know, you remember the alien in Men in Black where the head pops open and it's this tiny little guy driving the big body. Yeah. You know, or, or like the old mech suits from cartoons and stuff where you yeah. climbed inside and you move this robot. That's what it sounds like they're talking about. And not just here's your soul and your soul moves on. It sounds like they're actually just puppeting these right, bodies. Right. Right. Because it was a physical existence. It wasn't mm -hmm. a spiritual existence that they were trying to achieve. Right. Now, by 1975, they had about 70 followers and saw them sh themselves as shepherds tending a flock. Applewhite believed that complete separation from earthly desires was a prerequisite of ascension to the next level and emphasized passages in the New Testament in which Jesus spoke about forsaking worldly attachments. Now, members were co consequently instructed to renounce friends, family, media, drugs, alcohol, jewelry, facial hair, and sexuality. Well... I'm out. No facial hair. So, uh, <laughs> lost me there. Sorry. Yeah. Now, they were also required to adopt biblical names. Now, Applewhite and Nettles soon told them to adopt two syllable names that end in O D Y and had three consonants in the first syllable, such as Riccati, Jamadi, and Lavati. Hmm. Okay, I don't. That's not biblical to me. No, I, I was about to say they they want biblical names, but I, 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 I have never read those names. I've never heard ricotti in the Bible. Yeah, I've, it I, sounds I don't like a cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't remember the story of Moses and Jamadi, you know, right. hanging out. Right. 
I was thinking like, hey, can I get some of them uh, shells stuffed with uh, ricotta yeah. in there and some marinari on the top? <laughs> Sprinkle some jacati on top of it, if you would. <laughs> but Apple White said that these names emphasize that his followers were spiritual children. Okay. You get a ridiculous name and all of a sudden you're spiritual children. Yep. But in September of 1975, the group visited the small town of Waldport, Oregon, to give a lecture about how UFOs were soon going to make contact with the human race. Now, according to an article in the New York Times, roughly 150 people packed into a motel hall to hear Apple White's lecture. At, the fir at first, the town thought it was a joke, but soon 20 people or about one in 30 residents of the town packed up, told their loved ones, see you later, and took off. Wow. One in 30. Wow. Bought into this and said, adios, we're, we're, we're moving on. Now, in early 1976, Applewhite and Nettles had settled on the names Doe and T. So D O and T I, like Do Re Mi Fa So La Ti Do. Right. Um, that was that was now their chosen names. Now, Apple White stated that these were meaningless names. You know, in June of 1976, they gathered up their remaining followers at Medicine Bow National Forest in southeastern Wyoming, promising a UFO visit. Now Nettles would later announce that the visit had been canceled. Oh yeah, oh. yeah. She got a she got a message that oh oh they're not coming. Yeah, they they after, sent a telegram. They didn't show up. Yeah, sent a telegram. And go, we ran out of gas back there in the Milky Way, and <laughs> you know how hard it is to find a gas station in the Milky Way. That's right. We had to call Triple A and get them to bring us out. That's some good Triple A service though. If they're going to come out and bring you gas in the Milky Way. Was it they just asked for uh, 50,000 space bucks for gas, food, and tolls? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, after this, Applewhite and Nettles split their followers into small groups, with they, which they referred to as star clusters. And from 1976 to 79, the group lived in campgrounds, usually in the Rocky Mountains or Texas in the late 1970s, the group received a large sum of money, possibly an inheritance from a member or donations of followers' income, and it was used to rent houses, initially in Denver and later in Dallas. Now, moving on to 1980, Applewhite and Nettles had about 80 followers, many of whom held jobs, often working with computers or as car mechanics. In 1982, the pair allowed their disciples to call their families, and they further relaxed their control in 1983, permitting their followers to visit relatives on Mother's Day. Now, they were only allowed short stays and were instructed to tell their family that they were studying computers at a monastery because those two things go hand in hand. Yeah, I, I mean, I, whenever you te you say monastery, I immediately think of computers. You know, technological advances at the <laughs> monasteries. <I was> like what? <laughs> okay, that's the opposite of what monasteries are supposed to be exactly. about. Exactly. You're literally supposed to unplug when you go to a monastery. <laughs> now, these little vacations were intended to placate families by demonstrating that the disciples remained with the group of their own accord. In 1983, Nettles had an eye surgically removed as a result of cancer, which was diagnosed several years earlier. And she lived on for a couple more years, but she wound up dying in 1985. Now, this is crucial right here. This is a watershed moment for Applewhite. Now, he told their followers that she had traveled to the next level because, quote, she had too much energy to remain on Earth, abandoning her body to make the journey. Now, remember, they had been they they had been teaching all these followers that their human body was just a vessel mm -hmm. and that initially. 
They didn't have to die to transcend to this higher level. Right. But now one of their leaders died of a human condition. So the so question started coming. Now, again, you know, just like what I just said, the group had been told they would be biologically and chemically transformed into extraterrestrial beings and would be transported with their bodies aboard a spacecraft that would come to Earth and take the crew to heaven, referred to as the next level. But after Bonnie Nettles died, the, the group was just, they, they were confused. You know, how could this possibly happen? This is not what we bought into. So it required Applewhite to alter the belief system and revise it to include the leaving of consciousness from the body as an equivalent to leaving the earth in a spacecraft. So now he's he's trying to he's trying to explain Nettle's death by saying, well, you, you can physically die on earth, but then your consciousness goes and transcends to this higher level, just like you would if you were getting aboard a spacecraft. Yeah. The, the theology has to evolve in order to absorb what just happened and, yeah. and people not and see through the, the ruse right then. So, I mean, after Nettle's death, Applewhite went through a, a pretty significant depression. I mean, you know, this had sure. been this had been his partner, you know, in, in a lot of ways for all these years. And now she's gone. So as wild as he was, he he's still human. He, he's he's still going human, to grieve, you know. But during the early 1990s the cult resurfaced as Applewhite began recruiting new members. Now, soon after the 1995 discovery of the comet Hale-Bopp, the Heaven's Gate members became convinced that an alien spacecraft was on its way to Earth, hidden from human detection behind the comet. In October of 1996, Applewhite rented a large home in Rancho Santa Fe explaining to the owner that his group was made up of Christian-based angels. Applewhite advocated sexual abstinence, and several male cult members followed his example by going to Mexico City and being castrated. Now that you say that, I remember that. Yeah. Now, I, I'm... I'm not going to get castrated, but if I was, Mexico City is nowhere in the top 10 of places I would go to have that done. <laughs> well, and it's probably because at that time, that was the only place that was doing it. I, that's I didn't see that specifically, but that's what I assume. Yeah, that he's not he's not just rolling into a, a a physician's office in the United States and going, "Hey, me and my buddies would like to be castrated." Right. Because why? You know yeah. what? There's you know, hey, are you are you worried about having children? Uh, there's other operations that you can do no 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 we we want we don't want to have all these sexual desires we want to be castrated yeah. but it's the aliens that, that's, that's right. why we why we want it that's right yeah hey you see that that's the door mm -hmm. <laughs> don't let don't let it hit you on the way out but by using new technology, namely the internet, Apple White was able to reach a much wider audience with his theology, and his ideas were now fully formed for the world's consumption. Now, Apple White described the quote evolutionary level above human, or Tila, was like a physical place, an actual place place another world in our universe where residents lived in pure bliss 
and they nourish themselves by absorbing pure sunlight. Now, at the next level... I've heard that a few times from people, too. Like, it, it's not all in this same thing, but remember there was some guy that came out a couple years ago and said he had not eaten in years and he gets all of his nutrients through absorbing sunlight and he hasn't pooped in years because of it and like there was this whole thing obviously the dude was lying about that because you can't survive without food but right it, it was a, a big internet thing a couple years ago yeah so same same idea here right um But at the next level, beings do not engage in sexual intercourse. They do not eat or die. All the things that make us mammalian here. Now, Heaven's Gate believed that what the Bible calls God, as I mentioned earlier, is just a highly developed extraterrestrial. Members of Heaven's Gate believed that evil space aliens, which you remember Bonnie called Luciferians, Right. Falsely represented themselves to earthlings as God and conspired to keep humans from developing. Technically advanced humanoids, they had alien spacecraft, space time travel ability, telepathy, and increased longevity. They used holograms to fake miracles. And Heaven's Gate believed that all existing religions on Earth had been corrupted by these malevolent aliens. So they're covering all their bases. Right. So before we get into what happened next, let's talk a little bit about the techniques to enter the next level. That's going to lead right into what Adam is going to tell us about. Now, according to Heaven's Gate, once the individual has perfected himself through the process, there were four methods to enter or, quote, graduate to the next level. Now, physical pickup into a Tila spacecraft and transfer to a next level body aboard th- that craft. That was one. Now, in that version, um, which uh, has been described as a UFO version of the Rapture, an alien spacecraft would descend to Earth and collect apple white nettles and their followers, and their human bodies would be transformed through biological and chemical processes to perfected beings. This and other UFO-related beliefs held by the group have led some observers to characterize the group as some type of UFO religion, which I'd say is probably right on the money. That's what it sounds like. Now, the next way would be natural death, accidental death, or death from random violence. Now, here, the, quote, graduating soul leaves the human container for a perfected next level body. So this was the part where he explained how nettles could die and and still achieve this enlightenment. Right, right. The third way was outside persecution that led to death. Now, after the death of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, and the events involving Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge, Apple White was afraid that the American government would murder all the members of Heaven's Gate. So if that had happened, um, this was a way for him to explain that you're still okay. Yeah. If they kill your, your physical body here, then, you know, because of your beliefs, then you're still going to be trans uh, transformed into this perfected being. Sure, right. And the last way was willful exit from the body in a dignified manner. Near the end, Apple White had a revelation that they might have to abandon their human bodies and achieve the next level just as Jesus had done. Now, how in the world would you willfully exit your body in a dignified manner? Hmm. Huh. So before we before we spoil that, <laughs> we're, right. let's hand let's hand it over to Adam and uh, he's going to kind of pick up on what what happened from this point. So just to kind of recap, Applewhite and Nettles have gathered about 70 or 80 followers. Um, 
and they uh, they have they have developed their belief system that the spaceship is going to come and take them all up, give them this perfected existence um, with their bodies, and that they are going to live in this next level type heaven where there's right. no no pain, no suffering, no death. Everything is is amazing. And they believe that the spaceship in question is traveling behind the Hale-Bopp comet, which is in the process of heading through Earth's orbit. Right. So first, uh, Matt and I, we've been poking fun and joking a lot uh, in the beginning of this episode. This next bit is not a poking fun um, part um, this is a, a sad part, so uh, just wanted to let you guys know that we we may have been teasing in the beginning, but we won't be teasing about that anymore because this is not fun or funny. Now, Matt gave us the lead up to this final event, so let, let's get into the final event. And this is a little excerpt from uh, history.com. Following an anonymous tip, police enter a mansion in Rancho Santa Fe, an, an exclusive suburb of San Diego, California, and discover 39 victims of mass suicide. The deceased, 21 women and 18 men of varying ages, were all found lying peaceably in matching dark clothes, Nike sneakers, and had no noticeable signs of blood or trauma. The 39 people carefully planned their suicides, meticulously timing their deaths in three waves and following a, quote, recipe, which they believed would lead to a rendezvous with a UFO trailing the Hellbop Comet, like Matt said. Now, this next bit is an article, a bit of an article from the Baltimore Sun that came out on March 28th, 1997. So right at the time this happened. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but we'll get the gist of it here. San Diego County officials described yesterday the chilling tableau left by the suicide of members of the Heaven's Gate cult whose bodies, shrouded in purple, were discovered Wednesday afternoon. The computer-savvy cult members took their lives in distinct shifts. Some died in the previous 24 hours, and others had been dead several days, said County Coroner Dr. Brian Blackburn. Many of them carried with them a, quote, recipe tucked in their shirt pockets outlining the suicide method, he said. Basically, it just said, quote, take the little package of pudding or applesauce and eat a couple of tablespoons to make some room to pour the medicine in. Stir it up and then eat it fairly quickly. Drink the vodka be beverage, lay back and relax, said Blackburn. Now, he said deputies also found in trash behind the house plastic bags tied with elastic bands, which could have been used to suffocate the victims and speed up their death. The suicides were, quote, sort of immaculately carried out, end quote, Blackburn said. A video released yesterday of the death, death scene showed the bodies laying on their backs on bunk beds or on mattresses and one on a long folding table. Some had eyeglasses resting beside them. Blackburn said there was plenty of evidence left behind. Quote, these people all had identification in the front pockets of these big black shirts that they were wearing. Mostly driver's licenses, but also some passports and birth certificates. Packed flight bags or suitcases stood at the foot of many mattresses, and victims often carried $5 bills and rolls of quarters, he said. To say their goodbyes, the group mailed out videotapes in which their leader described the hoped-for space encounter, and members came before the camera two at a time, side by side. Quote, a lot of it was, was real and not very scripted. It was very self-evident that they were winging it said Nick Matzorkis, who discovered the bodies and went to police after his employee, a former cult member, received a Federal Express package containing the videos and a farewell letter. According to Matzorkis, the letter stated, quote, by the time this letter is being read, 
we will all have shed our containers, end quote. And that's the term that Matt said is what they called their bodies. And that's where we'll end that part of the article there. Um, but all the members of the group wore brand new Nike Decade sneakers. Mentioned that in the beginning of this, that they all dressed similar and they all had these black Nike Decade sneakers. Now, here's an article I found uh, from sneakernews.com that was talking about their shoes. It says, we will never know why the particular sneaker was selected by cult leader Marshall Applewhite for this tragedy, but we do know that all members were aiming for uniformity in apparel. Nike, of course, has no hand in any of this and even went on to cancel a sneaker release in 2008 that was said to be inspired by the actual event, the Heaven's Gate SB Dunks. Can you believe that was a thing? How terrible. Right? That is not cool, Nike. Even though they canceled it, there was a scheduled thing for 2008. So that means that somebody sat in a conference room and said, hey, what if we come out with a line of sneakers that's a throwback to Heaven's Gate? Yeah, and, right. And, and somebody, somebody said, hey, that's a good idea. Instead yeah. of a bunch of people going, that's a terrible idea. Right. You'd think that would be shut down real quick and not make it to where Nike had to cancel a sneaker release. Yeah. I mean, that's just that's bad form, even though they canceled it. Now, this goes on to say that almost two decades later, the story of the Nike employee who sold and hand delivered the shoes to the cult leader has been revealed through Reddit. Now, let's cut to a little further down in the article here. It says, you know the beginning. He sells the cult leader the shoes. Well, he shows him the black Nike Cortez, and the guy has an organized list of sizes that he needs, etc. So Apple White came in. He had a list of all the sizes that he needed and all that. Well, the guy at, and this says they're Nike Cortezes. They're not Nike Cortezes. They're the, um, the Nike Decades, but... Reddit, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever. Okay, so the guy that was selling the shoes asked him, oh, is this for a basketball team or something? And Apple White's actual reply was, well, something like that. Now, they have, uh, they have all the shoes, but there's one last size. And he calls another store and finds them for him because this says that he's such a great employee. And then he even decides to deliver them to that dude's address. This says cut to the next day. And he sees the news and sees the address is the exact same address that he delivered the shoes to. So can you picture that? Like you deliver these shoes to this guy. You just sold him a bunch of shoes and you hand deliver the ones that you didn't have in the store. And then the next day you see a news story and these people have committed suicide and they're wearing the shoes that you delivered. Yeah. And you know, one thing, cause ever that, I remember that being a question. Why, why were they all wearing the same shoes? Mm -hmm. um, there was something about this that I read that I, I, I didn't really get into. I didn't even touch on it really, but life inside the cult things were always the same. You know, it, it wasn't a matter of, well, this is just regular life and we're living through this cult. There was a lot of oddities about your day-to-day -day life in Heaven's Gate. Um, sure, yeah. Like when you were cooking something, you know, the, the burner would have to be on for only a certain amount of time. You, you cooked it for whatever you were cooking, you cooked for exactly this amount on one side and then you flipped it and you cooked it exactly the same amount on the other side and you took the pan off, you turned the burner off. There was an entire process and this was the way it was for everything. Everything was the same. So having all the members wear the exact same shoes for, exact same for outfit. this trip and the exact same outfit for this trip, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it sounds... Like, why in the world? But that's why. Because everything yep. like that was so structured. 
Right. It was about uniformity and structure. And you're exactly right. Um, that's why I didn't touch on it too much, but they, they had like big baggy black shirts, um, the same black Nike decade shoes. And then all of them had a sheet, purple sheet pulled up over their torso and head when they were found. Now, this article goes on to say over the next however many months, the the guy at Nike obviously goes through a dark time and struggles with questions like, what should I have done? Should I have known? Should I have said something or asked more questions or anything like that? Now, it says through the chaos of all this and the court stuff, he actually comes into contact with two other people in similar situations, believe it or not. Now, the first person is the woman who worked at a restaurant, and she served the cult when they came in for their, quote, final dinner. They all went to a restaurant, and it doesn't give the name of the restaurant, but they were all wearing the same clothes. Like we said, it's uniformity, and said they were all very polite. They all ordered the exact same meal down to the iced tea and peach cobbler for dessert. So everybody ate the exact same thing. Now, the manager of the restaurant even shook their hands as they left because they were such pleasant guests, it says. Now, the waitress also struggled with some of those same questions. Should I have said something? Should I have known? And the third person um, that the guy at Nike met um, was an insurance salesman. And the insurance salesman... Uh, is who the cult leader came to days before the suicide and purchased 42 alien abduction insurance pos uh, policies. Now, this says this article says 42. We know that there are 39 members. So my thought is this number is off a little bit. Um, but obviously, this was very strange to the guy, but the guy did his job and sold the insurance. And again, it says he struggled with the same question. Should I have said something? Should I have known? And before I go on here, I didn't know there was an alien abduction insurance policy. Nor did I. So I may have to look into that. Um, with what we do, we might need an alien abduction insurance policy. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what that goes for. Yeah, right. I'll call State Farm tomorrow. Now, these three people apparently collaborated over the years after that and they supposedly end, ended up creating the popular public safety message that you hear all the time if you see something say something so apparently these people were the ones that created that now again i'm not 100 percent. this is that's an article that i found on a rabbit hole that i went down today and I thought it was interesting, so I wanted to bring that up. But I, I couldn't verify that that was the see something, say something people because it didn't, that article didn't give their names. So I couldn't go back and double check that. Now, another article that was written in 2018 says on March 25th, 1997, Heaven's Gate member Rio D'Angelo who had taken leave from the cult, received a FedEx package containing Apple White's tapes and a letter saying, quote, by the time you read this, we will have exited our vehicles. Now, the next day, he discovered the decomposing bodies in the mansion and called the police. So he said it was like being in the twilight zone, recalls Detective Rick Scully, one of the first men on the scene. Quote, we were wandering from room to room to room, and every room we went into, we were finding bodies. You're thinking, when is this going to end? How many bodies are going to be in here? How many rooms are there to this place? Because every room we went in had bodies stacked up like cordwood, end quote. The members of Heaven's Gate all appeared to uh, commit suicide willingly. Uh, months later, in fact, two former members, Wayne Cook and Charlie Humphreys, tried to commit suicide together in the same fashion. Humphreys survived, uh, but killed himself the following year. So they, even after this, they were trying to meet up with the Heaven's Gate members. Now, Andrew Ross wrote 
um, in Salon that the cult members were motivated to commit suicide by their disillusionment with their lives on earth. He quotes one member who said, quote, maybe they're crazy for all I know, but I don't have any choice but to go for it because I've been on this planet for 31 years and there's nothing here for me, end quote. Now, the convictions of the cult members are apparent on the group's website, which remains online, um, heavensgate.com. It explains how their decision to leave Earth is not suicide and includes final testimonials from three members justifying their decisions. And we we had looked at these these um, exit statements um, and considered sharing portions of them, but they do get a little uh, they do get a little involved. Um, you can go and read them. Like Adam said, the Heaven's Gate website is still up, and when it's it's odd because when you get there, it's like a, a it's like a throwback in in time. Because it looks like, you know, those personal web pages people yep. would create in the in the mid nineties, you know, the, from the 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 star background, the position, the the way the mm -hmm. links are you know, are designed and everything like the, you know the old uh, you know HTTP coding that you would have to use in order to build a website, you know, so everything was was very simplistic, you know, looking. And, um, but it is still there. I was, I was amazed when I came across yep. it. I was like, I can't believe it. So s someone has been keeping it up. Someone has been paying for that domain mm -hmm. and it's still there. And, and like I said, you can go and you can actually read these exit statements that these, uh, these three members wrote and they do have their, their, uh, Audi name. You know, R right. R Ricotti and Jamadi and all that stuff. They do have those names are listed and you can read each one of those, um, their statement before, before this event. And it, and it's dated when they wrote it and it's all, they're all in the days leading up, um, to the, to the final suicide event. All right. So go to, go to their website. If you want to read those, um, you can also in the bottom of our show notes where we have our sources, um, the link to heavensgate.com is there as well. Now, this goes on to say that the role of the website in recruiting and indoctrinating members raised concerns about the power of the Internet um, because it was still a rare, rarely new phenomenon at the time. Um, one religion professor, Wendy Gale Robinson, surmised in a December 1997 issue of the Journal of Computer mediated communication quote freedom from the physical body and the free reign given to the imagination in cyberspace could have contributed to the cult members decision to go to the next if illogical step it's within the realm of possibility that apple white's ministry plus cyber culture was a toxic mix so saying that the heaven's gate website is still up let's go ahead and look at some excerpts from the heaven's gate website to end this out well it, it'll kind of give you a a good glimpse into what this website is and what they talk about quote whether hail bop has a companion or not is irrelevant from our perspective however its arrival is joyously very significant to us at Heaven's Gate. The joy is that our older member in the evolutionary level above human, the kingdom of heaven, has made it clear to us that hale -Bopp's approach is the marker we've been waiting for. The time for arrival of the spacecraft from the level above human to take us home to their world in the literal heavens. Our 22 years of classroom here on planet Earth is finally coming to conclusion. Graduation from the human evolutionary level. We are happily prepared to leave this world and go with T's crew. If you study the material on this website, you will hopefully understand our joy and what our purpose here on Earth has been. You may even find your boarding pass to leave with us during this brief window. We are so very thankful 
that we have been recipients of this opportunity to prepare for membership in their kingdom and to experience their boundless caring and nurturing. Now, here's the away team message that we talked about, um, part of it, at least. It, it's long. Again, go to their website if you want to get the whole thing. But this is the message from the away team that Matt talked about in the beginning here. Rancho Santa Fe, California. By the time you receive this, we'll be gone. Several dozen of us. We came from the level above human in distant space, and we have now exited the bodies that we were wearing for our earthly task to return to the world from whence we came. Task completed. The distant space we refer to is what your religious literature would call the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. We came for the purpose of offering a doorway to the kingdom of God at the end of this civilization, the end of this age, the end of this millennium. We came from that level, that time, that space, and entered this one. And in so doing, we had to enter human bodies, which we did, for the most part, in the mid-70s. Now it was time for us to leave those bodies, or vehicles, bodies that we borrowed for the time we were here by previous arrangement for this specific task. The task was not only to bring in information about the evolutionary kingdom level above human, but to give us the experience of working against the forces of what the human evolutionary level at this time has become. And while it was a good learning experience for us, it also gave all who ever received knowledge from that kingdom an opportunity to recognize us and this information and to even move out of the human level and into the next level or next evolutionary level, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the level above human, is a physical world where they inhabit physical bodies. However, those bodies are merely containers, suits of clothes. The true identity of the individual is the soul or mind spirit residing in that vehicle. The body is merely a tool for that individual's use. When it wears out, he has issued a new one. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven by trying to live a good life in this world and then thinking that when this world's life takes your body, you get to, quote, go to heaven. The only time that next kingdom can be entered is when there is a member or members of that kingdom who have come into the human kingdom, incarnated as we have, offering clarification of that information. To get into a discarnate condition just by disconnecting from your body doesn't mean that you are going to go anywhere, whether that loss of body is premature or not. When we step out of our vehicle, we have to know where and who our tour guide or shepherd is for what's next. We have to know we can connect with a shepherd whom we trust and that we have decided if that shepherd will have me, I want to continue to be a sheep, and I will do everything I can to please that shepherd. There's a lot more um, to that if you want to go finish reading that, but I, I thought that was a, um, a pretty good synopsis of what they believed um, as the away team message that kind of led to what they did yeah you know it it was and as adam said we we did kind of poke fun at at marshall applewhite and you know the 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 events of of his life that led him to this but this it, it ended up being such a tragedy um it's just hard to wrap your head around how someone could convince this many people that taking their own lives uh, based on this teaching was the thing to do. And it's, it's astounding the, the power that people can hold over another individual. Um, I just, like I said, I remember, I remember when this happened. I remember that day. It was all over the news um, that they had found those bodies in that house. Mm -hmm. And it was just, 
baffling. The I mean, pictures that were coming out from that, it was creepy that they were all dressed alike. They all had the purple shroud. There was, there was a, I don't even know how to explain it other than creepy factor to it that mm -hmm. as they were walking through and getting video of this, just how calm everything looked and you know the, the the continuity from body to body and because they were covered up you couldn't see their faces you couldn't see it, it was just it was surreal yeah yeah and you know just thinking about those family members who had that they had they had completely alienated themselves from their families and they had no communication with them or very very limited communication and there towards the end, you know, they, these families knew that, that they were entangled in some strange misunderstood organization. And they, they never dreamed that this was going to be the end result. No, no. Um, but it, it almost seems unfortunate when I was doing this research that, that comet, the timing of it was coincided with, you know, Apple White's teaching. Because, I mean, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, an event that only occurs every 2,000 years. Right. So if you have bought into this idea that there was a spaceship coming to take you to some higher level of existence... And next thing you know, uh, a comet that only appears every 2,000 years is on its way near Earth. I mean, yep. if, you were, if you were delusioned enough, then that just, that's the last piece to the puzzle for you. Well, and it, it's a shame that that, um, it all, I mean, it overshadowed the hale bop comet because now if you were alive during that time the only thing you think about when you hear hale bop is the heaven's gate cult right that's exactly it, right it will always be that way until you know two thousand years from now when it happens comes through again another memory can be created and hopefully a better one um but i mean i don't really know what else to say, Matt? We, you know, we wanted to cover it because this was a very, we don't do true crime, but this had a, a paranormal slant to it. Mm -hmm. Like Matt said, it, it kind of coincides with some of the things that we talk about, uh, UFOs, aliens, and not being true crime podcasters. We can't just do any cult and whatever that pops up. So we thought this would be an interesting one to cover. Hopefully you guys got some good information from it. But also we we do not have the time to do a full coverage of everything that happened. Matt and I were talking before we started this. And if we were to do that, we would have to have a whole series on just the Heaven's Gate cult. So there are other podcasts out there that you can listen to that go deeper if mm -hmm. you're interested in that. So go check them out. Um, you can just search Heaven's Gate, and I guarantee you you'll find a couple of them that have done many multi-part episodes on it. But we wanted to give you kind of the Graveyard Tales Cliff Notes <laughs> version right. of the Heaven's Gate cult. Yeah. So... Um Adam, I've, I've mentioned on this show before that one of my favorite midnight snacks is a bowl of cereal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a staple growing up. I mean, it, it didn't really matter to me what it was. I, if it was cereal, I'd probably eat it. Pour some milk on it and go. You got it. But as an adult, I, I'm a little bit more conscientious about what I should and shouldn't eat. And sweet sugary cereals 
especially as a midnight sta- snack, is probably not the best way to go. And that right. is where tonight's sponsor comes in, Magic Spoon. Now, if you're trying to cut down on carbs, sugar, unhealthy food, Magic Spoon could be a great solution for you. Magic Spoon is is a cereal that is just as good and just as crunchy and flavorful as those cereals you remember growing up, but it has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net carbs in each serving. And on top of that, it only has 140 calories a serving. I mean, that is amazing. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we're all on diets, seems like now. And, and, you know, you're trying to get healthy. And this is a great healthy cereal for you. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. So it fits into many of the diets or diet regimens that people are on um you know ashley and i've started going back to the gym and you can't just go to the gym and then eat whatever the heck you want you've got to kind of change your diet up like matt was saying the older you get the less the sugar you need so it's it's a cereal that actually fits in with what we're doing because of the amount of protein and the low sugar and you can build your own box of magic spoon the available flavors to build your very own custom bundle are cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, blueberry, and cinnamon. And they say if you like peanut butter cups, then mix cocoa with the peanut butter and it tastes like you're eating a peanut butter cup cereal, which is amazing to me. I love it. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of the fruity one and the peanut butter one is good. So you need to go check it out. Yeah. If, if you're if you're wanting a healthy substitute to the cereal that you normally eat. And you can go to magicspoon.com slash grave. That's M-A-G-I-C-S-P-O-O-N dot com and grab a bundle of cereal and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code grave, that's G-R-A-V-E, to save five dollars off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So to get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal, go to magicspoon.com slash grave and use our promo code grave to get $5 off. So tell us what you think. Um, you know this this is really a, a subject that's not um, just you know out there. We we don't we don't know that if they were right or not. You know they're they're not here. We we assume sure. we assume that they were not. Um, but what do you think? I mean, maybe even even broader than Heaven's Gate. You know this this whole idea that someone can come up with, you know, an idea and present it in such a way that other people can just completely abandon their lifestyle, you know, to follow a, 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 a single person or a pair of people and, and, and follow their teachings so rigorously, um, just completely brainwash essentially. Um, what, what do you think about that? You know, we've seen and while you're discussing it. Uh, remember the rules of the graveyard, the etiquette of the graveyard. We do not make fun of other people's religion or anything like that. So just as as a reminder, we can discuss it, but keep the graveyard etiquette yeah. and no arguments. Right. We're, we're not opening this up for a, a, a theological discussion. It's just this idea that, you know, someone can, can hold that kind of power over a group of individuals and uh, can convince them of something that, as we look at it now, it seems so outrageous and so unbelievable. But yet these, these 39 individuals fully believed it. 
all the way to the end. So the best place to do that is going to be in our Facebook group. Um, and like Adam said, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of great members in there. Uh, we are, we are happy to provide a safe place for open discussion, but, um, you know, let's, let's keep it clean and, and, you know, we don't want any, anybody poking fun, anybody getting angry or, or being offensive. You know, we're not going to, we're, we're not, we're, we're not going to open this up for, it's a big religious debate. We just kind of want your thoughts about this and, and maybe, maybe other cults and, and how they've, uh, how, how how things played out for them and what their their beliefs were um but you can also go and check out our website it's graveyardpodcast.com and on our website you can listen to the show you can find links to purchase graveyard tales merchandise like the uh the 8 bit skull mike logo shirt that I'm wearing tonight um, love it you can you can find that in our in our other logos and and stickers and mugs and shirts and and everything so uh so go check that out um as adam mentioned at the top of the show please don't forget to go and rate and review us on itunes it brings us up the chart and it helps bring more people into the graveyard so uh for adam and myself until next time we'll save you a seat in the graveyard See you soon. Magic spoon. I was really hoping that it was gonna it was gonna need an answer for me, and I was just gonna go testicles. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, no. And I, I I could see it in your eyes. You were waiting to jump for that. <laughs> <laughs>